looking at? Welcome to Season 5 of the Big Sci-Fi Podcast with Adina, Brian, Chris, and Steve. The biggest sci-fi podcast in the galaxy. The adventure is just beginning here at the Big Sci-Fi Podcast, and we invite you to come aboard the Starship Tangent. We know you'll enjoy the conversation, the laughter, the banner back and forth, and most of all, friends who love hanging out to talk about all things science fiction. Set your phasers to fun. Here we go. Podcasts, the final frontier. These are the recordings of the Big Sci-Fi Podcast. It's ongoing mission to explore films, TV shows, and literature, to seek out new and interesting people to interview, to boldly go and talk about what we love to discuss, science fiction. Tonight's episode, Davy Perez. However, before we begin, let's introduce the crew of the Big Sci-Fi Podcast. Our captain, Brian Donahue. Hey, I was waiting for your voice to change. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was supposed to change like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, our engineer and science officer, Adina Mignona. Hello, hello. Ship's counselor, Chris Fox. Hey, everybody. And me, I'm Steve Merkin, the guy in the red shirt that seems to be always around in the background. <laughs> First, let me th say thank you to our Starfleet Command, better known as Trek Geeks, for making us a part of their podcast team. We've done so much to promote ours and other podcasts like the Sci-Fi Sisters, and we are so thankful to be part of their group. Now to the interviewee. Back on September the 8th, 2023, I was at the Paramount Studios lot to support the writers and actors that make Star Trek and who were on strike. There I saw friends from our podcasts like John Billingsley, Larry Nemechek, Mike and Denise Okuda, and the wonderful Michelle Hurd, who gave me a hug. Aww. I also got to meet Walter Koenig for the very first time as well, someone who was there from the very beginning. In addition, I got to meet scriptwriter Phyllis Strong, who worked on Voyager and my favorite, Enterprise, and who we interviewed earlier this year. And then at the end of the day, I was introduced to whom we are interviewing today, Davy Perez. Davy? Please say hello to our listeners. Hello to your listeners. How are you? <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. And that's what happens when you're a literal person. You say <laughs> things. <li> <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, I know we have a multitude of questions to ask you, since you are the writer for Strange New Worlds, one of the writers, that is. I guess the first question I'd like to ask you is, can you keep a secret, Davy? <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. I'm really good at it, and it's part of my job to keep them. Good, because listeners, we are not, and we will not be discussing season three of Strange New Worlds in any way, shape, or form. Think of season three as a Christmas gift. Currently, the writers, the actors, the production team are all busy making, wrapping, and putting a pretty bow on season three. So we're not sneaking a peek. Sorry. But we will be talking about Davy's work on season one and season two, which he has written four scripts for those seasons. So without any further ado, I'd like to pose you the very first question. You were, grew up in East L.A. Yes, that is correct. Did you ever go to El Tepeyac for dinner? El Tepeyac, I must have. I'm pretty sure I have on more than one occasion, yes. Uh, my, my, my daughter, Jenny, when I told her who we were interviewing, where you were from, she goes, well, make sure you ask him if he's been there and if he's ever had a Manuel. I don't know if I've had the Manuel, but uh, I know I for sure have gone to El Tepeyac. Yeah, uh, the, for, for those who don't know, the Manuel is a five-pound burrito. Oh, good night. <laughs> yeah. I know one, time, <laughs> uh, one time I went there with my buddy Ross, and we attempted to have an eating contest, and I got about three inches from the end of it, and I finally gave up. 
and he oh. pointed and laughed at me. It's a <laughs> it's a great place. It's a wonderful place to go to with great food. And so, I'm that was the first question which was posed by my daughter Jenny. So, um, oh, well, uh, the answer is uh, of course. Uh, who hasn't? And it's been a while, <laughs> uh-huh. but no, I've not uh, uh, ventured to try and finish the burrito. <laughs> it's 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 well, just get a Holland Beck. It's only half a Manuel. It's really good. So um, I guess the real first question I'd like to ask you, and I think it's also in the minds of others, is uh, what was your first experience with science fiction? Was it a book? Was it a TV show? Was it a movie? Can you recall what kind of sparked your interest in this yeah, genre? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is going to sound like I'm pandering, but it, the, the reality is the first movie I saw in the movie theater was Wrath of Khan. Um, Excellent. I, I wow. was yeah, I was uh, too young to see it. Um, I was probably about five or six years old. And uh, my older sister, who was uh, in her preteens, went with friends. And I had to go, and she had to watch me. And it was a double feature. It was Wrath of Khan and Friday the 13th Part oh, 3 or something. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> So, so when, you know, I'm sorry, sci- the sci-fi and horror front and center, uh, which probably makes sense to a lot of people who might follow the things I do. Uh, <laughs> but I, I remember everything. I loved the movie instantly. I knew it was the show that my dad would watch like really mm-hmm. late at night on syndication. Um, and those con worms, I just freaked out and uh, mm-hmm. was like, but like fascinated and, and obsessed, you know. That That's interesting. Um that I explains to, a lot yeah. because, you know, some of the episodes of Strange New Worlds are like the darker episodes, the, the you know, the more horror inspired ones. Yeah, I, I, I did can, Supernatural I, too. Supernatural, yeah. is, uh, I yeah. came out of that camp and I do tend to, um, you know, being born in, on Halloween and, and, and having these films, you know, I think the, the next movie I saw after that was like Exorcist. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so At six years, years old. Probably six or seven. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's these like th- this horror and this <laughs> sci-fi and this way too advanced uh, type of a tone is being imprinted on my young mind. But I was both scared and fascinated by it, you know, and interested in it. And I, I kind of wanted to understand it so it wouldn't scare me as much. And then now as an as a writer and a creator, I, I definitely go to those wells. Mm. Interesting. Well, definitely with uh, your episodes from season one. And, yeah, I, and yeah. and I have to say I am in the camp where I love the Gorn reimagined. Um, at Thank first, you. I at first I was like, oh, but then as I thought about it, I'm like, how could they possibly make them look as cheesy as they did in the original series? And for it to, for us as an audience to accept it, I mean, it had to be reimagined, right? And it was mm-hmm. terrifying, especially the little baby ones. Oh, yeah. My God. oh yeah, that's horrifying. Oh. Well, well, yeah, I mean, you, you you touch on a lot with that comment, you know, for our show. Um, a, you know, a lot of the things we try and do is like, what would they have done if they had the money to do it back then, right? And right. we're not trying mm-hmm. to take away or reinvent or, you know, we are just trying to sort of, uh, as fans of the original series and all the other series that came after, interpret like what was the intent and and how can we use that in a new way um and you know with the gorn and you know they were a one episode character but they mean so much to so many people and the message of the episode was so important and it, it they're iconic you know so it was um you know how do we how do we do that and some people were gonna i felt uncomfortable with it you know a little bit but i also was like i want to see what we could do in our version of it and I have to say, like Akiva, when I met him for the first time on Zoom, as I was, you know, um, going through the process of, of uh, trying to get on the show, he said, you know, uh, what are some of your favorite episodes? And I said, oh, you know, Balance of Terror and Arena. And he said, well, you know, um, I want to do the Gorn. I want to, I want to make them uh, uh, the villain uh, of season one. And I said, I, 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 yes, can I be on the show, please? <laughs> now I really want to do that. And so it was something he had in mind. Um, and, and, you know, our interpretation of them was, it was very much guided by sort of his, his vision of it. And then the more we got other writers on board and I came on board, we all got to collaborate on certain things. And, Mm. you know, um, I was just very, um, fortunate to be able to write those two episodes and sort of, um, get into the specifics of some of the mythology of, as to, um, how they grow, what stage are they and, and, you know, um when they're born they're so and i think 
a conversation we had was we know that they can build starships. We know that they're intelligent beings. Right. But if we want to tell a monster feature story, how do we do that and not like totally undo what we know these creatures are? So it was like, what if they're just when they're babies as as part of their development cycle, mm. they're just that's when they're the, the monster. And then as they get bigger, they get smarter. And then um, eventually, you know, and there's a whole there's there's a probably notes and notes of stuff that never ended up on screen as far as like what their breeding cycle is and 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 why you know they're why so many are born but then only one survives and then that's the one that gets to be allowed to kind of develop into adulthood and and develop you know intelligence and maybe go off and captain a ship and get stuck mm. on a planet with James Kirk someday <laughs> very interesting about um the the creation of the Gorn for because in the first in in the first episode that you did you didn't really see them you just got to see you just kind of knew about them they were right. you know you it was more of a it was more of a submarine adventure in the first one you know the battle and trying to find what's going on where they are and all that but absolutely in the, but in the second episode where you revealed them it took me when I saw it I'm going wait a minute where have I seen these creatures before and not in this TOS episode, but it was in Enterprise, the second mirror episode. Mm, and yep. in that one, the Gorn was more like how you portray them, more vicious, more you know, bloodthirsty and and violent. And I thought, okay, hmm. did you guys tap into that and say, okay, that's the Gorn we want to have in this in our well, series. Well, you know, we're, it's funny because <laughs> we're fans of everything, Trek, and we want all things to make sense. You know, and, and ultimately, we want all things to be true for whichever part of it you like, you know, and so we don't want to take away, um, but we want to add. And so, you know, we mm. did talk about that there, the like, as we were talking about the Gorn, there's like other versions of them have been represented. We even talked about the Gorn wedding in Lower Decks, you know, like we wanted to, you know, mm. people are fascinated by these characters and we want them to enjoy them in any way that they enjoy for themselves. And this is just a version of that. And yes, you know, how can we make it make sense that they're intelligent and you can do a moral story in an arena, but also make it make sense that they're vicious and that they're, they, you know, we, we didn't want to make them look like a digital Yoshi character that that enterprise because of the technology at the time kind of <laughs> kind of looks. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. uh, but we, we, we wanted to sort of take all these little pieces and put them together and say, yeah, you know. And, and look, like people, many things can be true. You can say someone is nice and someone is mean, and they can be both things. And you could so a Gorn can be what it is for this story because we're encountering a a specific Gorn and a specific mm -hmm. type of phase in its development. And um, you know, you could develop a, a, a or see a Gorn and, and and have it have a different experience with it. That's the beauty of stories. Like, it, not everything is going to be the same every time, and, and not every uh, species is a monolith, you know? We, we've asked this of other people. I think it's important to ask, ask Davey this. What got you started in writing? Yeah. And then let's yeah. then let's jump back into the Trek stuff we're passing. Sure, yeah. No, I right. mean, um, I in a lot of ways, I've always been writing. Um, mm. I, I would journal as a kid just because I had a lot of things going on, as much many young people do. And then I was in bands, and I would write song lyrics, and they'd be a little too uh, – they wouldn't be punchy enough. They'd just be a lot of – like, basically poetry instead of song mm -hmm. lyrics. Mm-hmm. Um, not that song lyrics can't be poetry, but it was just, um, a thing that I was always doing. And then I, I actually started to take, um, acting classes and oh, that's kind okay. of, you know, I wanted to be telling stories on screen or be a part of it. I didn't know how to break in. No one showed me the steps to take. And I just saw, oh, if I can be on screen, then maybe that's the way to do it. And so I went to an acting conservatory and, um, after about four years there, there's like a course where you start to write your own scenes and you, you come in, you know, and I really liked mm. that. I started to like, well, I just want to do that part of it. I, and um, uh, off of that was actually teaching young kids, inner city kids at an acting school. Um, and they all wanted to perform. And so I would like make these little one act. Oh, wow. Play adaptations. And that that's really when it codified 
okay, I love doing this and I could do this like in my spare time. And so how do I get paid to just do this? And, 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 um, you know, that, that would, it took a long time to make happen for myself. It wasn't overnight, but it, the drive and having that passion kind of kept me going to, mm. to, to go after it. Awesome. Thank you for sharing so, that. Dina, go ahead. I was, yeah. Okay. So in <laughs> writing, uh, oh gosh, now how do I phrase this question? When you're writing the Gorn in season one and you're working on the first of those two episodes, so episode four and episode eight, how much of episode eight do you know while you're writing mm-hmm. for like how much of it was written kind of simultaneously versus we're writing this episode, then we're writing right. this one, then we're writing this one. Um, it's a good question because we, what we did know was the concept of nine. Like we talked a lot, like what we do. Nine. Yeah. Sorry. My bad. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> um, the, the, we talk about the characters and we talk about the journey that we want to take the characters on throughout the season. And so for Lon, we knew she had the backstory about being a Gorn survivor. We knew we wanted her to confront that fear. And then we wanted her to really have to confront it head on and, mm. and, and sort of deal with these personal demons. So that arc we knew, which meant that we knew we were going to have the Gorn in two episodes in order for her to have that character journey. And then we talked about the genres of episodes. And so we knew that episode four was going to be a submarine movie. And we knew that episode nine was going to be our horror movie episode. Like we had planted those to be the genres. And uh, so those pieces of the stories were, were known before we even broke the specifics of the uh, story beats and the scenes and mm-hmm. just, you know, all of that. Um, and another thing that was known since we bring up nine, we knew as a horror episode, we, we talked very specifically, what do horror episodes do and what do we like about horror episodes? And very often they kill off a character that you don't expect to die. Mm-hmm. Um, especially yeah. with Hitchcock will do it in the first act. Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. And so what? we, we, you know, not to bring up the source subject of Hammer, <laughs> but I know the dun, question's dun, dun. coming at some point. <laughs> yeah. um, it is. We knew before we knew it was an Andorian, before we knew mm. it was Bruce Horak, before we knew how much we would fall in love with this character and wish we didn't have to do this, <laughs> mm-hmm. we knew <laughs> we're, we're going to kill our engineer in episode nine. And yeah, that's, uh, I was going to say, because when we had Bruce on our show, the person I asked him was, when did they tell you, you, you know, did they tell you you're going to only, you're only going to last nine episodes? He said, uh-huh. He knew from the very beginning he was only going to last nine episodes. So, so, so now, so let me let me kind of follow on that. Is given that he then had a couple cameos in season two, was that in response to how much the character was oh, liked, or when question. did when was that decided? Well, that was in response to how much we liked Bruce as an actor, okay. as a person, okay. uh, how much of the just Trek family he became. You know. Mm. Um, you can like a character all you want, but it, that, that doesn't translate into you now being a Klingon. It tra- it's the performer, mm, right? Mm, sure. uh, and so um, we it, and and, and I, I remember we in, in theory we were like, okay, if we're going to kill the engineer, we really have to fall in love with them for it to mean anything. Yeah. So the character was designed for you to like. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, but then we did such it a great worked. job. We did it yeah. too well. It worked really well. <laughs> oh, wow. Bruce was amazing and his chemistry with Celia was so great that yeah. it was like I remember like having a moment like, are we are we gonna do this still? Is this the right choice? And ultimately it was like, well, if we're feeling this, then it was successful. We designed it successfully. Mm-hmm. You know, and so let's let's commit to it. But because we love Bruce, it's it was like where can we fit him in? How do we bring him back? And Mm-hmm. Trek has a wonderful uh, history and legacy of, you know, being able to bring characters back in 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 makeups and sometimes not in makeups, you know, <laughs> just just bringing them back because you like them. And so we we wanted to find a place, and that's how we we found the the yeah. Klingon captain for him in season two. So because Bruce is so awesome, I'm going to shamelessly plug something for a second. He is as of we speak, he is mm-hmm. he's narrating my my book, my my latest science fiction novel. He's Lunar doing the audiobook for logic. that. Lunar awesome. Logic. So just have to plug that uh, since we, we brought it up. But no, but that's, yeah. uh, again, it was an amazing character. Yes, you're, you're right. We fell in love with him. 
And then to, so it's interesting to understand how the show comes together and how mm -hmm. and when these decisions are actually made, because I think a lot of us still, and I know I did up until recently, now that we've been learning more and more about what happens behind the scenes, but I think for a while, a lot of us still think the w that that episodes are created the way they were back in the episodic television days, right. you know, 20, 30 years ago, where it's a quicker turnaround. So yeah, these things aren't necessarily known that far in advance and things in a given season get responded to closer to real time. And, and the fact that it's not that way anymore, I guess, has its pluses and minuses. You sure. know, it, you get your great story arc, but yet you have yeah. these you know, we're not we're, We aren't airing at the same time as we're writing necessarily that season, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, uh, the previous season airs and we, we get reactions from that. And that might inform us in some ways and, and some things could adjust lightly off of the reaction to the previous season but you know when you when you once you're committed and you you're you're in a vacuum you know literally that first season was like we created it we liked it 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 looked great to us but we didn't know what the audience was gonna feel yeah. on, and how they mm -hmm. would react i mean we were well into production uh, late production of season two when season one aired so, wow. like, you know, uh, many of those scripts had already been written. And in fact, I, I want to say, like, I was in the middle of production of episode eight, maybe when season mm. one aired. Like, that's how mm -hmm. the timeline mm -hmm. is a little like so. So creating two seasons of television almost in this semi vacuum of experience and just hoping that we're going to touch people in the way we like to be, uh, you know, moved around emotionally and um what is cool for us is going to be cool for the audience we hope you know and and that's sometimes we get it right and sometimes we upset right. people and that's just the nature of it and it, you could do that even if you're writing congruently with airing you know sure and one of the yeah. strengths of the show in my opinion is how quickly i became attached to the characters mm-hmm I just yeah, felt too. like like that is something the writers deserve such high uh, props for is and the actors too. I mean they they Absolutely. have to play it well too. Um, but I just the characters are so interesting, and the characters we know uh, like Ohura are different enough, but still th there's the essence there. They've done right. the writing and the actors doing all that together it's just it that's one of the things that really impressed me the most about the show it looks fantastic the production value is incredible but yeah uh you. it's got the it's got the feel that star trek fans i mean well i've been waiting for you know, for a little while thank you for that and um you know i i come from uh, supernatural as you mentioned and that was a show where I learned for me that, yeah, the show is cool and fun and has monsters in it, but um, people really love the relationship between the brothers uh, and the angels and the demons that are in their lives and mm -hmm. the car, you know? And so it's really about these personal collections that, 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 that you develop and all the other writers, the shows they come on, they, they've learned that, that same lesson. So for us, it was like, well, let's make sure we're, servicing the characters mm. and then make sure our episodic stories are from a perspective of one of our characters and so we could be with them on this journey and we sort of feel feel their closeness um all of the actors on the cast are amazing and bringing these characters to life and imbuing them with them their selves and a lot of our writing you know we're tapping into these personal places and um you know each of us is kind of putting a piece of ourselves in them so that when they do come to life hopefully like you mentioned the people respond because there's something true about what you're what you're being connected to you know no i, I have to say that the the team that chose the actors for this series picked great actors to portray unique and you know memorable characters from star trek lore and have done it very, very well. I mean, even to the point where I remember reading and saying that you chose a Scottish actor to play 
Scotty. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that's that shows that. But but even so, every one of your characters are so likable. And here's the really weird one. Your reimagining of James T. Kirk <laughs> is so damn good. It works. <laughs> it works. It, it, works 100%. it works. I mean, I like him even more than Shatner. I like him even what? more than really? Chris Pine. Wow. Yes, I like him. I like wow. the way that you. Yes, I'll, I'll I love the way you Paul wrote him. Come on, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, great. Was him at his best. Yeah. He yeah. you made him so human. Well, you know, and you, so likable. It, it's funny that you mentioned that because a lot of times when we try to you know, bring characters to life or a storyline to life that is going to mm -hmm. touch on very established canon and very personal feelings for people in the fandom, we kind of just go back to the source and we, we try to go back to the original intentions mm -hmm. that we think the creators had. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about young James Kirk and, and, and he's how people talk about the character and how mm -hmm. he was actually portrayed when you watch the episodes, you know, in the 70s and throughout the 80s and 90s, he got the, the reputation of, oh, well, Kirk's always kissing the alien or he's this, the guy with the swagger. And we we make jokes, light jokes about that. But the reality is, is in the series, he was always talked about, oh, he was bookish. Oh, he was the overachiever. Oh, and, and mm. then you, you watch those some of those episodes and he's always trying to find a path to empathy and he's, mm -hmm. he's very likable and he is charming. That's why he gets to kiss the alien because he's just naturally charming. So we focused it more on the, who is this character? Not who do you think the character is, but who is the character really? How was he created, designed? How was he written? And what is our, our reason for bringing them on? And how are we going to mm -hmm. use that? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Cause you could just very easily have, we could just write the jokey. Oh, he's always trying to hit on the people and he's, that's what he is. But that's such a, a one note take on the character that we mm -hmm. were like, no, let's flesh him out. Let's, and he's younger. He's not a yeah. cat. Yet. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and how, how would this character be influenced by our captain Pike of the enterprise and yeah. our, uh, yeah. cat, uh, you know, the crew people that are being uh, populating the enterprise right now. Yeah. So in tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow in that one, to me, he was most like the original 1960s Kirk more than any other time we see him in the series. I yeah, I think that's that's true. And, and I think yeah. there was a lot of conversation about trying yeah. to channel e even, you know, you know, in season two and, and uh, in that episode and in the one with um, Ahura at the space station, we were like, yeah, we, we need some light humor about his reputation. But it was like he was the one who believed her. He was the one that was willing to think out of the box. He was the one who actually sort of empowered her to go through that uh, journey that she was on. Um, all simply because he saw someone who needed help and he wanted to be helpful. You know what I mean? But but even so, your your actress who plays Zavora is so wonderful. She's amazing. She's yeah. so sweet. Salia. And she is playing a really well-established and iconic character and who was played by a remarkable actress. So to step into those shoes is almost like... You know, Zachary Kinto going, oh, yeah, I got to play the <laughs> <Yeah>. most famous <laughs> character of all Star Trek. And I got to play opposite him in the same movie. Right, right. You that, know? I'm sure that was not daunting at all. No. Yeah. So, I mean, you, 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 to do that and to come across and to make her so likable. Well, she's um, she really is very remarkable. talented and, and a, a total pro. And I think um, we had conversations in season one about where her character is at. And I think she embodied that so gr mm -hmm. greatly because it was, yes, everybody knows and appreciates and, um, you know, Uhura, I always say it wrong, Uhura. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like whoever's... I think like, all five all, of us would say yeah, it differently, like, probably. Right. And and I, different I, ways. Yeah. In the same yeah. sentence, I could say, you're Uhura, Uhura, and, and I, I get... <laughs> crap for it all the time because I shouldn't <laughs> I should be one of the people who can say it and pronounce it accurately every time and and mm -hmm. I don't know why I can't but anyway circle back to the, the the actual thing I was trying to say which was the character was seen as um a young person with greatness in them that needs to um find the path to uh, allowing that greatness to come mm -hmm. out 
you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and, and it wasn't about the, like the insecurity of that. Cause you could play that. And that's the sort of the one note, but it was the like, and, and, and also the other spectrum of the, I'm so great at everything right away. And that's also not an interesting thing. It's more like you're, you are a character with greatness in them, but you haven't realized it yet, but you know, mm-hmm. it's there. And so, and, and other people realize it. And it's how do you foster that greatness without, letting it sort of like yeah. pressure you and feel a certain way, you know. Chris, you've been the quietest of the yeah. bunch. Will you have yeah, any been... questions? Go ahead, my friend. Yeah, Chris. sorry, I was trying to jump in a couple of times. It's okay. <laughs> yes, please do. Please uh, do. talk a lot. You got to cut me off. I'm super garrulous. Yeah, so I, you sort of touched on this with the various characters, but I'm just wondering, just because I think like this feels like it's it's such an amazing show in that it feels like the original series, but it also feels very modern and it feels like, this is what they would have done, as you said earlier, like this is how they would have made the original series. If Star Trek only came out, you know, in 2022 instead of the sixties, how did you, so how have you been able to manage making it feel like original series, but also making it feel like a modern show that doesn't go too lean too differently from the original series sure i mean it's a hard balance um you know i I have to really give a lot of credit to akiva goldsman and henry alonzo myers for um setting that uh as a north star kind of thing in season one and also uh jonathan our production designer and uh, costumes hair everybody is sort of a full court press um about the look uh, of the show the props and and um, you know everyone's a fan and will will pull a screen grab from an old episode and be like hey this is what it looked like in the 60s let's make our version of this um and you know so balancing the look and the feel i think is a lot of the world itself uh you know right down to the the, the costumes and 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 how can we make them have that classic feel but still feel modern and not silly um and then the stories themselves um you know i could say for me i i like to watch a lot of all the series you know tng and tos in particular and kind of tap into that episodic story and how they maybe approached a topic of their day and and how can we approach a topic of our day and not to totally reimagine and think that I'm going to create something wholly new that's never been told before, but how would we tell it our way? Mm. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. um, how do we, some tales are, are unfortunately classic and, and um, some mor- morals are not learned, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you have to keep reminding people about tolerance, about peace, uh, about the things um, that scare us can sometimes make us stronger. You know, those things are, are people in humanity have been telling those stories since the cave dwelling days. And I'm not going to come up with a new story, but I can come up with a new way of telling it that that is going to interest you because it's this world that you love and these characters that mm-hmm. you love. And I, I, I kind of went a little uh, esoteric there, but that's kind of, that is my personal process. And mm. I, I actually think a lot of the Twilight Zone. I, I love the Twilight mm-hmm. Zone. And I'm like, what would the Twilight Zone episode be? What, mm. would the, what would the interesting take on this be that makes you go, hmm, I didn't think of it that way. Or, oh, that's, I'm a, slightly uh, uncomfortable about this, but I'm, I'm interested, you know. Mm. That's, that's there- really good. I'm sorry, Steve. No, no go ahead, Brian. Is, is there, has there been anything in the, the course of seasons one and two that has surprised you that either the writing team went there or the show went that direction, or maybe it's a character arc or something? Is there anything? Or, or maybe maybe a better way to ask it, 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 surprise or just that you particularly really loved, maybe? Well, I mean, I think there's – it's both um and it's interesting because it's an episode i wrote i think the the um i mean all of season two had surprising things you know mm-hmm. I, I, the animated crossover obviously is not one i wrote <laughs> but i was just surprised we were able to go there and that's always fun mm-hmm. the musical mm-hmm. was such a great uh, you know that we really crossed into a genre that hadn't gone before but the one that really like because i was so inside of it was the joseph and benga uh, backstory uh, mm. and and how this character who's a beloved doctor and is it kind of up to that episode 
feels like a moral center of the ship. And then yeah. you learn that he's a combat veteran with with a bunch of confirmed kills that might not have left the war behind. Yeah. You know, and, and so um I really when, when we were like, we're gonna tell this story, I wanted to do it as much justice as possible. And I did a lot of reading, I did a lot of documentary watching, and I, I uh talked to combat veterans. Um and and um at every step of the way, I was like, are they really going to let us do this? Are they really going to let us mm. tell us? Are they going to say we can't make the doctor be this way? Because, you know, I, I come from network and you often get a, the note kind of early or sometimes late in the game. We don't want to dislike our character. We can't tell the story with this character. Yeah. So it, 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 it was a hard thing to have your character do something, make people uncomfortable, but still be kind of on their side at the end or at least understand why they were on that side that they were on if even if you weren't on that side with them i can tell you when i watched it all i could think back was the tv show mash and every, <laughs> every time every time the transport was a incoming transport and all i could think about radar riley like, incoming yeah oh i, and I, I mean, like, look, oh my I god no you you have you've got the mobile army surgical team Right yeah. there, I, it was just, it was remarkable. I have no shame. In, I have no shame <laughs> saying I watched a lot of MASH when I was Good. writing that. Because, uh, you know, like I like I just alluded to, like stories have been told before. People have figured out certain things that are effective. And as a creative person, you know, I, I, I know the limitations of my own experiences. So mm -hmm. I have to research. I have to watch. I have to be inspired. I have to pull from things. And when I was watching MASH, um, I was, it was two reasons. It was like, how do I keep it interesting and engaging, but also like really have a little gut punch in there for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And, you know, I had, I had about 20 minutes to tell that war storyline and guess what? MASH episodes were about 22 minutes. Yes. So I was like, what would a MASH episode structure be? It's funny and light, but it's also got these dark things. And obviously mine wasn't as funny and light, but I got to create a character that you kind of was quirky with Clint Howard. Um, and so yes. as I was watching it, I, I just became like very conscious of that repetitive thing. And then, um, it really hit home when I was watching, I think there's a show called combat rescue that's on lifetime or, or one of those mm. reality, um, things. And what they had, it was in, a, in Afghanistan, I believe. And it was about these combat medics in Afghanistan. And anytime, um, they had to go out into the choppers and go pick up people, they had a bullhorn. And it would say Leroy Jenkins. All right, Leroy Jenkins. Leroy, yeah, and so yeah. And, and it was this. And at first, it's funny. The first time you hear it, it's like, oh, right. she, they're using Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> but after watching that show for a while and seeing the the things that like that Leroy Jenkins, it was like, oh God, and it, it weighed on me. Mm. And it became mm -hmm. a horror to hear that. And I was like, how do I channel that emotional like? just that sound is evoking this dread and, and just please stop because I know that that means young people are dying, you know? Yeah. So one of the things I think you, you completely nailed it with this, because I've, I've dealt with um, several friends and other relatives who have struggled with PTSD from, from combat and non-combat situations in the military is you completely nailed the sense of, they are unable to talk to those of us who have not experienced it. Like mm -hmm. hit that, that, that got as, cause I'm one of those people who, uh, they can't talk to, you know, when yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. should be able to. So you completely nailed that. Well, that well, was thank amazing. You. Thank you. And, and it's, it's funny. I, 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 I take great pride in, in that. And I, I feel um, honored to get that compliment. And I got a lot of messages actually from people asking me, were you in combat? How did wow, you, wow. you know, did, mm -hmm. were you there or did you know someone was there? And it, the irony, uh, that's not even irony. That's not the right word. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, um, like I said, we often tapped into our personal lives. I have PTSD from childhood trauma. And mm. so I could tell a story about PTSD, about what I know to be my experience with PTSD mm -hmm. and just port it over to it. But, but at the same time, I do not know what combat is like. I say that front and center. It is a different mm -hmm. experience. 
but I will research and I will I will talk to people. I will be informed. I will try to get as close as possible. But when you're talking about the human experience of dealing with trauma, I know some things about that, and that's where it got mm-hmm. personal. And I mm-hmm. I I have been that person who can't not share, and I have been that person who looks to um, alcohol for relief or has a sudden burst of anger, mm-hmm. and um, and then having to not be able to explain where that came from. Um, uh, so, so that was a very personal story that I was channeling into the writer and then just put the layer of combat of veteran on that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's something therapeutic that art like a show like this can do for people. There's, there's, there's a a type of, it's not that it's the answer and healing is completed when you watch a TV show that talks about this. But I, I know some people too that are Star Trek fans that have seen combat that saw that episode and were just like they nailed it. It was on, but and it's in, but it was done tastefully. It was done yeah. very respectfully, as well. Um, and so I think, uh, hopefully, that's what any person that's been in combat could say that hey, that that honored. Yeah, and then, then, then we went through, uh, you know, and that that's where I, I take uh, I, I find that to be the best compliment, you know. Right, I, right. I, I don't I don't really I don't know what the critics might say about it. I don't know what uh you know if, mm-hmm. if you're if you're busting on me because the Klingons don't look like the way you like Klingons. I, I, <laughs> you know, but if if the, if the people that have have that that real experience can say, well, that was actually you know, and for being a, a war in space in an imaginary right. sector of a galaxy. <laughs> For them to say that's what it felt like for me, that's mm-hmm. that's a huge compliment. And I, I you know, uh, I read the things they carried, which was about Vietnam. I read the uh, the Dakota Deco- mm-hmm. Meyer uh, biography of, that was about Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. I was watching these. I was feeling, and I uh, like for months, and like to the point where, it, like, it, after the, the production of that episode and through the rhymes, I needed a break. I was right. like. Yeah, I, I I I completely took my family to San Diego on a little in a resort week mm-hmm. and unplugged. And I and I, I you know in the middle of production of of uh, I think the the musical which came after I was like you guys are go singing in space. <laughs> I just came out of Jagal. <laughs> I'm gonna go yeah. to Legoland and SeaWorld <laughs> and hang mm-hmm. out in Carlsbad and with my family because <laughs> it, it was living in me in such a, a yeah, heavy sure. way. Sure, you know, you know, we did a um, a review of second season on this show. We talked about it, and I said that this second season truly was strange new worlds because you ex- you delved into doing Star Trek in a different way and either was a, a beautiful crossover episode with Lower Decks, which was just, just absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. And had they had so much fun doing that. And then doing something like Subspace Rhapsody, you know, that's how I kept thinking going back to the, um, Buffy episode, where it was a musical, which right. is acclaimed. <laughs> and I can listen to the music any day, and the same smile comes to my face when I hear it, because it's Thank just... Who who came up with the idea to do that? I That's mean, the one I'm asking, maybe. That was... Look, I mean, it, it's hard to nail it to like an individual, because at the beginning of the season... Like 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 I said, we we all the writers get in a room. We talk about genres. We talk about uh, things we've done, and I I would honestly say that that might have even got thrown around season one as kind of like, uh, you know, a half joke, right? A joke, but not really. And it's like all joke pitches. This is something Dana Horgan always says: all joke pitches become real pitches. <laughs> and, and then um, you know, at the beginning of season two, we talked about what genres haven't we done, and and mm. you know what genres do we want to do again, and you mm. know, uh, we we did talk. You know, Henry Alonzo Myers has done musicals on the Magicians, and Supernatural has done a musical, so we knew that the musical was a format that television does well. The Buffy episode, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the so Flash the Flash did it too. Yeah, the Flash, and the, yeah. the the thing that you mentioned though about how beloved the Buffy episode was is like that was the bar, right? If you're gonna mm-hmm. do it, 
Mm-hmm. You got to have the story matter and not just be singing through the story. And the songs got to be actually, you know, and this is where Dana, who, who co-wrote that episode with Bill, was very much kind of put, guiding that uh, through the process. She was like, the songs can't just be catchy for catchy sake. In a real musical, the song actually pushes the story mm-hmm. forward. And the, mm-hmm. the, the scene is the song, right? Yeah. The song actually has an arc and it you like you start it and you're in one place and by the end you're like you're in another place mm-hmm. and 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 she was the perfect person to be quarterbacking that experience and you know um uh i was like great you guys you guys got the musical i've got klingons you know killing people and um <laughs> you know uh and and the other one that i co-wrote, co-wrote with kirsten Bayer, i really really do like the the lotus eaters one uh, mm-hmm. quite a bit because mm-hmm. you, you're you're going back to Rigel Seven which is a part of Pike's canon you're sort of modern yeah that was cool it, it, mm-hmm. yeah it was like a piece mm-hmm. of the cage yeah. that you're kind of modernizing for our mm-hmm. our, our audiences mm-hmm. and then you're like in that was this opportunity to do this the the Twilight Zone for me like what is the like little moral story that's underneath everything it's not like hitting you in the face. Mm-hmm. But it's there. It's the, it's a it's a a a caste society of the haves and have-nots. It just has memories and have-nots memories instead of mm-hmm. you know money. And so there was this cool world-building thing of like you can watch it, enjoy it, and never get that from it, and just be this oh this cool sci-fi world had this mm-hmm. weird planet experience. Or you could watch it and be like oh they're commenting on disparity and what does that mean? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Uh, so do you have a oh, God, Chris? Go ahead, Chris. Do you have a specific process when you sit down to write an episode? So not when you're necessarily breaking with other writers, but when you're by yourself and you have your computer open. Um, I feel like I used to have a conscious process, and now I have a shit, it's due, and I got to <laughs> sit here and, and get it done. <laughs> <laughs> And, but to be to be fair to your question, I think I can probably do that because of a process that I engaged with that mm. has now become like repetitious for me. It's like going to the mm. basketball court and, and shooting habit. and shooting free throws, right? And then now I don't got to think about the free throw. And so, um, if I can sort of recall the process for me, you know, the outline is there, right? The outline has been done, and the outline is the roadmap. Mm. I know that this is the order of events. Mm -hmm. And so I just go in and I say, okay, this was the promise. We promised them this scene. But I know from experience that you don't just make your character say these words and that makes a scene. That just makes an outline that people are talking about out loud. So you still have to go in and say, where is the activities and points of view that these characters have that make it a scene and sometimes it's not even there sometimes it's um and and this is a lesson i learned at supernatural was like you know at the beginning of every episode they catch a case they they're oh this monster killed somebody in in iowa right (laughs) uh how do you make that interesting for 350 episodes well, you find something for them to do. Dean's cooking eggs. Uh, Sam's um, trying to paint something or the car's broken. So you're like, the scene is actually now this activity. So I, I think about who's doing something and who wants something, which is an mm-hmm. old acting exercise. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not even like the words of the, like this has to be the moment that Pike confronts lawn about something and that's just a scene i pulled out of my butt whatever Mm -hmm. um but how can i make that like if the story has already evolved to a point that we we know what they're up to oh this person's investigating and this person want answers that's one thing but if you're just flat and coming in you're like well i gotta make this something i gotta make this uh you know lawn's on the way to the gym and Pike needs to get this answer because Starfleet Command asked him to, <laughs> you know, and that's not in the outline. The outline was Pike is asking Lon some questions. And and so you kind of, mm-hmm. you, 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 it's for me, it's like bringing the characters to life. What is the character going to 
where are they coming from? And mm-hmm. that, that, that's all my, my acting background. Where are they coming from? What do they want? How do they feel? And then I kind of let them talk to each other and then they start saying things and that sounds mm-hmm. cool. And, oh, they're talking too much. Like take some of that away, you know? Um, are there characters that you find easier to write their dialogue versus harder? Like ones that the voices come net more naturally to you or ones that look, are harder? I, I mean, yeah. by this current season that shall not be named, um, season <laughs> three, uh, it's sort of a habit. It's sort of like, a they, you know, in the beginning, I knew what Spock sounded like. And I had a <laughs> feeling of what Pike might sound like. And Chapel and, and Uhura maybe kind mm. of. Mm -hmm. a manga it was just sort of finding the archetype of you know oddly enough i knew hammer because you know we were talking before the the podcast role um he's an engineer and a mentor and my older brother's an engineer and was a mentor to me so i knew what i wanted that character to sound like at least for me when i wrote him you know Mm -hmm. he might be written a little differently in other episodes but for me i was like this is my brother uh and so even the line about you know an engineer's tools are his mind and his hands Mm. i think uh i had co-written that with Bo, and i think the line he had in there was engineer's tools are his his hands and i was like no i know my brother his best tool is his mind and and so Mm -hmm. it was just like little things like that that i was like just wanting to make sure I, i i brought some point of view to it you know yeah and speaking of hemmer (laughs) <laughs> uh the i i just again watching that episode originally episode nine of season one um when i realized what was happening i was like you know devastated as i could be watching a show but at the same time it was so beautiful it was just it was so well done and set up and we just care deeply. I mean, even in that episode, I think there was, in my opinion, a lot watching it just recently again, Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot done even in that episode that made me like Hemmer even more so that the impact of him dying uh-huh. Was even more effective. Terrible. And well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it well, was a rough yeah. night. I couldn't sleep. I, was just like, <laughs> I fell was... asleep just fine. But uh, <laughs> I kept waking up. I get too invested. I kept waking up, being like, "Oh no, Hammer's dead." But um, it, it made I'm, for a good podcast afterwards. I, I was sorry, unpacking it. Uh, I'm sorry and delighted at the same time. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, like you know, it, again, it's like, how do you? How do you make people fall in love with a character with the limited amount of time? Mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. and and Bruce was a big part of that. Yeah, Bruce Horak mm-hmm. embodied this character, and we showed him playful in, in um, the pilot, I believe, mm-hmm. um, or or maybe it was the second episode. The the, the scene mm-hmm. where her has to do the captain's dinner. Yep, yep. You, you got mm-hmm. you got a little bit of his playful side, and then in four, yeah, that was good. Um, you know, we I, we kind of wanted to do the. Um, the grumpy person that you have to earn their respect, right? And so he was kind of like down mm-hmm. on her a bit. But then they they kind of like, you know, and that was like total submarine movie 101. It was like the yeah. sergeant and the private and the sarge is, you know, hard on you, but then they end up, you know, giving you the best recommendation that you could imagine. And <laughs> so there was a little bit of that leaning into that. And then it was at nine in particular, because we were like, well, we're, we are going to kill him in this episode. And it was the end of the season. And it was like, we were, it just so happened that it weed so great, greatly, great. It weed so Mm -hmm. greatly with her own arc of having to find her place here and to have the person who you kind of like, well, I'm flipping with you and you're the fun whippy person to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you in a real way. Like, I see this need in you. I'm going to call you out on it. And and then in tapping into your vulnerability, then I'm going to die. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. and, and, and that scene, it, like, there was a lot of permeations of that scene and it, just getting it right and how much is too little, how much is too um, yeah. late. And and um, a couple of things were, were, were working for us there. Like... Uh, Again, Wrath of Khan, the 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 scene of Spock giving doing the mm-hmm. self sacrifice, total callback to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the words that he spoke um, was advice my brother gave me in reality. Wow! wow. When, when I was a young man, 
and feeling uh, alone in the in the world. And he he he's got a, a very successful marriage, and he had kids before me, much much uh, younger than 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 me when he started his family. And and that that idea of, you know, hey, just find find a home, find a person you can fall. Like he was telling mm. me about relationship advice. But I took that and I, I, how do I take that nugget and make it a little bit more broader and make it more specific for her? But the, the idea of making a home for yourself and you'll, you'll be happier than you are mm. um, sad was was totally channeling my brother Raul. Wow. That's great. That's do really engineers give the great, the best advice? They do. <laughs> we do. And they're always the ones to party and hang out with. He's, he's much yeah. more fun than I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, because again, that all came, you know, as an engineer, the mentor relationship also came true because that is a mm. very big part of engineering. And it is something that we, we just dis discuss all the time to try to, especially the, the team that I've been working with for the last few years, a lot of, you know, I've been watching my mentors They're, They've been retiring the last few years. In fact, one of them, you know, mm. when I, when I lamented his retirement, he was like, well, you know, cause I'm like, well, who's, you know, going to be the adults around now? And he's like, well, Adina, mm -hmm. you're the adult now. Yeah, in the room. Yeah. And I'm like, what? I still need adults, you're adults around. <laughs> but the reality is, is, you know, I've been kind of a mentor in, in that role as, you know, other people at my level. Mm. That's just what we do. That is part of the process. You don't, you don't, you only learn so much in school. Most of it is on the job and what you, what you learn from your mentor elders um, in the workplace. So Absolutely. yeah, a lot of that, you know, rang true. Well, I'm I'm glad, and so you, now you see where I got it from, and yeah, you know that makes sense. And, and I think a lot of people can probably, um, it, at least in some certain fields, it's true in mm -hmm. creative fields too. Like mm -hmm. you, you, you can only learn what what you can at, by making some mistakes. And then there's hopefully people that are above you and a little bit more seasoned that have made those mistakes already mm -hmm. and can say, wait, you might want to look at it this way or or let me save you some time or you're not going to learn it unless you make the mistake. So go ahead. You know, yeah. and, and all of that is is that mentorship journey, you know. Yeah. Can can I ask you a question with regard to season the episode nine, which is I'm I when I was watching it again, and you know, it'd been a while since I'd seen it. And I assume that as you say, other things influence your writing and bring those forward and things like that. And as I'm watching that episode, I am seeing so much of aliens in it, the movie, the the child that's the only the survivor, the young yeah. girl's the only survivor. Yeah. You have the creatures being born out of right. someone who's a host. Um, you see Sam Kirk acting so much like Bill Paxton's character Picks? of overreacting <laughs> and getting so, yeah, you know, no, right, right. we're going to die. We're all going to die, you know? And I just did that. And I, I again, no one steals because better than James Cameron, he's the greatest stealer. Sure, of right. Time. But <laughs> do do other I, I films mean, and things like that? Th does that get into your mind? Going, you know, these are really good. I uh, I couldn't I couldn't sit here with a straight face and say no. You know, what okay. I mean, because uh, like clearly, you know, uh, Alien and Aliens were movies of my childhood that I absolutely love, and I, I'm mm -hmm. a big Ridley Scott fan. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of hard to, it, we're, you're going to do horror in space. So it's kind of mm -hmm. hard not to evoke those things. Mm -hmm. We had talked about, you know, how do lizards procreate and, and how do we want to make mm. these things, uh, you know, body horror was a big discussion. And so uh, there was a, a, a Kayla Cooper had this clip that she showed us of this, these frogs leaping out of the back of another frog like the eggs oh, wow. and so that's where that idea kind of came from ah, okay but then it was like well this does feel like alien and how much do we le like swerve into this kid and how much do we not but there was other films that i i definitely were, mm -hmm. were pulling from um you know people don't don't always mm -hmm. mention this one but gremlins you know, oh, tiny, my tiny, tiny, yes. tiny monsters wreaking havoc around you and freaking mm -hmm. you out and you know, they're they're you know the 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 whole sequence of Chapel in the lab and they're all mm -hmm. over her is Gremlins, right? Yeah. Um, and then um, also the thing, you know, the John Carpenter frozen oh, yes. in landscape and and the horror of, um, you know, just the, this this intense you know survival mm. and where it's around yeah. the corner. And so there was a couple 
absolute influences that were just mm -hmm. seeping. And, and yeah, look, it's we have 50 minutes to tell a story that people have told in two hours. So mm -hmm. what are some what are some shorthands and and I'm sorry, but what are some shortcuts that are just going to get people to understand right away what what's happening yeah. and what's going on and um and we did we knew we're like look we're putting this little girl here this is this is you know newt like should are we being stupid for doing this but ultimately <laughs> the story was about Lon and mm -hmm. Lon was a little girl when she was on yeah, a warm green yeah. planet and so it was like look sure yes echoes and shades and it's very parallel but this very specifically calls back to lawn and and mm -hmm. that's why we decided yes we need to do it this way you know now it, it worked perfectly and and just i mean it was the right level of terror that was needed mm -hmm. and then yep. we get into episode 10 of season two and you go holy moly you've <laughs> really pushed the gorn to like oh these things aren't evil yeah evil. <laughs> right and at this phase in our canon they 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 can be that for us right because mm -hmm. we not until kirk has to be stranded on um you know cest on it's not cestus but the planet just beyond cestus mm -hmm. uh with um a gorn do we learn to maybe empathize with them mm -hmm. right now they are the unknown and nothing is more scarier than the unknown and, and akiva had a real strong vision for um this in particular because he said and he's he's correct trek always teaches you to identify with your enemy trek always teaches you that mm. everything can be worked out that mm. we just need to find our common ground and he's like how do you do that when you are faced with something so unknown and so foreign that you just cannot find the common ground right now and so that was like in its concept of how to write that that's why we didn't see them at all in that first episode because yeah. they we would identify with them too much if we got to see them mm -hmm. because they're just the things in that ship that want us dead, you mm -hmm. know, and we it hear was... them and we know they're out there, but it's just, yeah. um, you know, it, it, the they're... unknown enemy, the unseen enemy. It's, it's terrifying because mm -hmm. you don't know what you're dealing mm -hmm. with. Yeah. And then except one person and she's the, she did it as a child and she right. had those mm -hmm. nightmares, those monsters. And she's telling were... you, you can't reason with them. You can't yeah. Reason with them. And right. so yeah. you're only, you're reliable quote unquote, maybe unreliable because of her experience, person is telling you, don't bother talking to them. And so, okay, well, so what do we do? We run, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a well. general comment. I'm a music guy. I love talking about music compositions, especially with Trek. I think Star Trek has a rich and vast history mm -hmm. of fantastic music associated with it. Um, and to put that into the, um, kind of the realm of writing. I really feel like Strange New Worlds in season one and two is just is is this beautiful symphony of different movements and pieces and adventures we get to go on, like we would some of the great symph symphonies, um, or a great musical score of a film we love. Um, that we really. I, I just want to say kudos to you and the rest of the team. Like it just, we went on such a journey and it was, wow, thank you. it was fun. Mm -hmm. And it, and episodes were different from each other. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, that's, that's was, our composers, right? It's Nami, that's Jeff. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, there is conversation of evoking themes that we are familiar with and using those. And then also the, the genre helps, right? Mm -hmm. This is a genre what is the music that is best in that genre? When is yep. it a sweeping adventure? When is it a a um, a slightly more m melodic mm. uh, moral tale? You know, right? Yeah. Well, I'm very happy that they decided to um, at the end of season one of Discovery decided to bring back the Enterprise, Captain Pike, number one. These characters and the fact that they decided, you know what, this came out so well. We ought to make our own TV series about <laughs> it and how we get we're lucky to have gotten strange new worlds to watch. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. And and I think um probably the in addition to that, one of the best decisions that was made in the inception phase before I even got on board was to make it an episodic show mm -hmm. and yeah. let mm -hmm. let you have a one week adventure let you fall in love with characters who will evolve over the course of these 10 mm -hmm. adventures. But like 
to give you the self-contained I think that actually has a lot of goodwill for all these comments we get about you evoke it so well and the classic mm-hmm. trek so well because mm-hmm. classic trek was this mm-hmm. little hour that you got and you were told a premise that then kind of resolved itself however that happens by the mm-hmm. end and um that I think was mm-hmm. a huge um value as and 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 a part of the reason I think for the success that we enjoy is to be able it it, it makes things easier and it makes some things harder you know it's a different type of storytelling mm-hmm. you know uh, you 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 can't lean on four episodes of 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 you know building to a thing that then you're so invested to like you have to mm-hmm. really get people invested in that you know a brief amount of time that you have for your setup but the the payoff is is great because at mm-hmm. the end you feel like ah i understood what that episode was and why they did it and whether you liked it or not, it's another story, you know. Yeah, because to me, you if you seem to have captured the best of both worlds, where you have every episode is essentially self-contained. There's a story; it mm-hmm. resolves itself, and then you go into the next one. But you still have a through line. You still have Pike dealing with his future trauma. You still have all the other characters and their storylines, but like balanced in such a way that it's not favoring one. Like it's obviously favor. Fav- Sorry, favoring um, uh, standalones, but it's not to the detriment of. Well, I wish these characters would change. So right. I think that's just what a perfect balance. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, but that was also part of the design. It was like you know, episodic stories and serialized character arcs. You know, and it, that that was very much intentional. And you don't want your characters to have amnesia and not have had the experience of two weeks ago. But at the same time, like much like in life, we're not always talking about the thing that's on our mind. And so mm-hmm. you don't have to be like re-, re constantly having scenes about a thing. It wasn't like Lon in season one, every episode was like, oh, that Gorn breeding planet, or oh my God, the Gorn are going to come get me someday. It was established. There was an adventure about that. It was kind of in the background, and then an adventure really brought it to the fore. Mm-hmm. And 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 you, you know, same with Pike. It was the oh, I know my destiny. Is this going to make me a good captain or not? None of that matters. I'm just going to have the, the time that I have. It's on his mind. It's on his mind. And then at, in the finale, it's like oh, you haven't really fully resolved this. And here's a whole story about that. And and so you you couldn't have had that finale if you didn't understand the character. Maybe, but you could have still had that finale because you could just set up your future self as coming and you're about to make a mistake. And here's a lesson about making that mistake, you know. When you're in the writing room with your fellow writers and you're working on a script or you have written a script, does it go around the room? Like when you wrote your the fourth episode of season one, did the script go around the room? And do they all go, yeah, Davey, this is just beautiful yeah. let's just put it on the refrigerator because it's perfect it's it, there's nothing <laughs> well, wrong I with wish, it at I all wish. or do they go do they each import a little advice to you and then you go you know you're right and i'm going to change that because this is what the character should have done or would do or whatever yeah. um well i you know it's interesting because i'm at the upper levels a little bit. So, um, and even with the lower levels, I, I shouldn't quantify that with, you know, all writers are, are talented and they're all on a journey, but um, it doesn't really go round robin. What, what kind of happens is that the script comes out and everybody reads it. Mm-hmm. And then like a few people will come and say, really liked it, but there's this one moment that, uh, you know, I thought this could be a funny joke there. Or, um, hey, I was reading it, and you, you kind of got me confused here. And so these these sort of ad hoc things happen. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, with me, I would get specifically notes from Henry and Akiva, right? Because they were the, the, the writers of me. Upstairs, okay. Right. Yeah. And so they would say, we read it. Here's some of the changes that we think would make it better, some of the things that we were expecting that didn't happen. Or, hey, you gave us exactly what we expected, but it doesn't work. And so... That process kind of, you know, the notes from above, that 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 okay. still happens, you know, and then we hand it to our, you know, production partners at Secret Hideout, and they will give their round of thoughts, and then we hand it to the studio on the network, and so it all kind of spirals upwards, um, 
You certainly, and then there's a table read, and then after the table read, actors will have questions. Hey, I, this line can it kind of felt funny in my mouth, and mm-hmm. um, and then you know the writers will have been on the table read and and watched it or been in the room and said, you know, I didn't catch this before, but now I'm gonna. Get, so it's constantly getting refined. Like you're not wholesale like pulling all these threads. You know, uh, the bulk of the work is kind of done in the in the front half of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it just goes through the pipeline of collaboration to just kind of be at the place. The directors who come on will say, look, I have to shoot this. Um, but you know what, this location doesn't exist and Mm -hmm. we don't have it on a stage and could it move? Could it be this way? It's easier for me to put the camera here. Or I have this great idea to emotionally make you feel something if I can do this, but that means this line might not work. So you're, you're just working in that collaboration of everybody just trying to make it better you know so how does that dovetail with your role as a producer i, I mean is it a similar hat is it really a, a different hat that you wear it's it's a, it's a similar hat. so that yeah i mean look there, there's the writing phase where you put a bunch mm-hmm. of things down on the fa- page and then there's the producing phase where you're trying to bring those things to life and i i i, I think i've done this enough to be able to decouple those two a little bit Mm -hmm. when you, when you're kind of just getting to see some of the first things that you've written come to life, there's a tendency to hold on to everything because you work so hard for it or because you know, darlings. Yeah. Or because you know, like, (laughs) Oh my God, the studio really liked that moment or, Oh my God, the, the, but then as you've done this enough and you've seen enough of these episodes go through the editing process and you've seen them go from what they look like. You realize that some fights are, are not vanity in a, I don't say, but, but they're, they're just a, mm-hmm. a, it doesn't change the needle one way or the other. And is this really the moment that I need to adjust? Um, and then there's moments that, that it is, and you have to know the difference, you know, you have this, this is this important enough? And sometimes it could be as simple as a word, like, oh, they're using the wrong word. Does it have the same intention? You you know, and it's a small thing, but like saying uh, someone was, can do something versus someone is able to do something might have a different meaning in a scene. Hmm. And one might sound condescending. And so it's like a tiny little thing or it might not. And you're just the wrong fight you know and so that that muscle is very much the producer muscle uh also the the like uh oh my god i'm watching this and this is too long and it it read really great but like it's too long now do i tell the director to paste it up and make the actors talk faster or do i cut a few lines um you know so you are actually so you are there when they're filming the 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 episode you are there as executive producer and personally uh, for for the episodes i've written absolutely and then at times for um helping out on other episodes um that that i'm sort of in that mentoring process or Mm -hmm. the writer couldn't be there for other reasons um and so you know who's going to pitch in so yes and and um you know the, the the producing on set part of this you know it's interesting because it's a big when we met on the strike line right and that's a big part of what the guild was trying to bring back you know i have been fortunate in my experience in the broadcast circles and in the you know 22 episode full order procedural circles to have had that experience to have had that sort of factory floor to have had the scene something go from idea to the edit bay to air um and there are lessons and skills that you just cannot learn unless you go through that process and so that's the guild was sort of trying to remind the industry that this is how television has been made for decades literally Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it's changed and guess what it's making things harder and more difficult and actually the the you're you're feeling it now too because there's this whole bunch of talented people that are missing out on part of their job you know what i mean Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was a good question. I, I I had written down that I was wanting to ask you was, you know, when I met you, it was right in the heat of the the strike for both the writers and the actors. And you were forbidden to talk or promote. We couldn't ask right. you to be on the show at that time because you couldn't discuss blah, blah, as it was called at that time. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Star Trek. How did <laughs> what did you do during that period of time while the strike was going on? How did you keep your yourself in tune? I mean, you know, it's the off season, and I'm going to go to the batting sure. cage and keep yeah, you know yeah. working on my batting swing, or I'm going to keep throwing fastballs to keep myself tight. I mean, it, what did you do during the time that you were on strike? I went camping. A lot with my kids. Um, I went on some road trips. I read some books, and I kind of um, unplugged actually because I did. I did need a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. And but like the thing that I really impressed upon me that I really wanted to come back with is, you know, we are telling stories and we're hoping to tap into a human experience. Mm -hmm. And if I'm living in a fictional headscape and I'm making stories just sort of, I know this works paint by numbers. I know I have to do this beat here. I know that the act out has to be here. And so I get to, I might actually sort of start being circular and insular and being too formulaic. So that time I really, you know, I, I really just said, what is my experience of life with my kids and, mm -hmm. and how am I, kind of being a family man, what, where am I in the world? I did I did a little bit of that artist introspectiveness mm -hmm. to kind of reset myself creatively so that I don't come in going, this is all going to be this. I know this is this. Move on. And I really was like, no, 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 no. What is the human experience? What is mm -hmm. the audience experience? What is the thing that is going to elevate this to be saying something? Mm -hmm. um, because you could forget those things. And, and because it is like we touched on earlier, so much a repetition of form. I don't want to lose why I'm doing the form. Why I'm, what am I using the repetition for? Not just for its own sake. You know what I mean? But you were excited to get back to back to writing when it was uh, over with. I, absolutely. I mean, uh -huh. to engage creatively and and almost immediately once the strike ended, you know was thinking about star trek but also thinking about other stories that i might want to tell um outside of, you know of of trek you know to be blasphemous for a reads for a second uh, but you know uh, uh just, just it's okay the, we like other things too like other things oh yes too. okay yep. well you know yeah is 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 ancillary not in mm -hmm. not in, not in replacement of yeah. um is there places where i can uh you know as i wait between the seasons do something in in yeah. um, what would that be and, and and in a kind of really fun interesting way i think what i found is you know i am a genre guy and i love that you know because there was a moment of like oh i gotta tell i gotta get back to straight ahead dr drama or real world uh what would my real world stories look like but then i sort of just really had the moment to be like you know what i found the wheelhouse sci-fi fantasy mm -hmm. horror and it's a fun wheelhouse yeah. and there are different mm -hmm. there are different types of, of those genres now it is not a bad word it is not a a thing that only hacks do mm -hmm. you know there's 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 elevated there's pulp there's comedy within it and so i i, I kind of found this niche of embracing the um label of of the the you know if you look at the body of work like I deserve that label. I, that mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. is kind of what I do. Doesn't mean I can't do the other things. If something came along that I was really like, "Ooh, that's a detective story," or "Ooh, mm -hmm. I want to do that," but you know, I have a comfort zone. I have a go-to place. I clearly it's there, and so don't fight that. You know what I mean? Is there a novel in you? Because we have a couple of novelists right mm -hmm. here. You um, know? I think there used to be one, um, but I think there's like. Probably there's a TV show and a film in front of the novel. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There's there's other things that are like, the, I think the novel is for like when I'm like, I'm tired of being on set and being away from my family. Like, I'm just going <laughs> to yeah. go away world and let me have uh, <laughs> six months, you know, maybe. But but I, I think there's, um, you know, I have directing aspirations. And, and that's, oh, that's cool. I, 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 that's good. Now, I, because because we've talked about that, is that some people are just, they're novelists. And they're not script writers, and some people are script writers, and they're not novelists. Yeah, and I think I live in the cinematic world. I think I live on the on the. Um, I I can be quick with a script. I can be, I can shorthand. Like if someone 
points out a story problem in a script, I, I can fix that very mm -hmm. quickly and turn that around. Uh, I think a, a novel is, is, is a unique, uh, great, you know, piece of, of literature and I would be so lost and I would mm -hmm. be just me, you know, I'd, I'd write the 400 pager that makes no sense. You know, I think <laughs> it, it just, the, the, having no sense of the process guidelines or boundaries, I think with, with a script, I know the limitations. And then I also know like when to ignore those and just go mm -hmm. for it because it, it, mm -hmm. it, that's the point in the story where you have to do that. You know what I mean? So, right. Yeah. That's kind of funny that you say that. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming you're familiar with the save the cat beat stuff. Yes, I am. Yeah. I am. Because that's actually what I use to write my novels is that, oh, really? that structure. Well, and there's actually a book. So Save the Cat is um, a method or a structure for structuring writing. It came right. out of the film and TV industry. But there's then um, an application of that. Uh, and specifically, someone wrote a book, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, and that, funny, that is after reading like a thousand different structure books and things like that, the Save the Cat was the one that resonated the most. I didn't. I, <laughs> I, didn't I didn't really buy into Save the Cat. I, I did the Sid Field books. I read when I mm -hmm. was kind of um, really in, early in my process. But then I I, um, I went to junior college and took some some film courses and and was actually the thing that really worked well with me and actually worked great for television is what they call a real theory, which is um, and it goes back to the original mm -hmm. films where eight minute reels. And those eight minute reels had to, because of the film stock, literally it was a practical reason mm -hmm. why shorts were eight minutes long. And the first sort of features, and we're talking silent black and white movies, were basically eight minute reels that were played back to back to back. And so you could have a half hour, but it was really like mm -hmm. four eight minute reels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of the practical reason of having to take a reel off and put it back on, Every eight minutes was a mini little cliffhanger. Every eight minutes was like, so every little eight minutes had to have a satisfying story and make you want to come back for more. They, and so the, so the, the, the eight minute real theory is basically as you're telling a cinematic story, where are you in the story that like you're, you're keeping them hooked? Like mm -hmm. you got it. Where are you bringing them in? And you know, I don't, I'm not so rigid. I'm not going like, Oh shit, it's page eight. It's page 16. But mm -hmm. In television, you have caked in act breaks. You have those mm. moments that you're, what are you reeling people in? And it mm -hmm. goes back to, you know, we don't really have commercials and streaming. We have ads. But it, it, in back in the day, it was like, and now we're going to cut to the car commercials mm -hmm. and you better come back. And how are you not going to change the channel? And so <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It, that theory of keeping them engaged, keeping them interested, and then, oh, keeping them What's the question they're asking that's going to make them want to come back for the mm. answer? You know, yeah, the the way well, again the three act story is you've got the first you know ten minutes of TV and then the next ten minutes and you know <laughs> you, and you're breaking because and you've got a car commercial in between each one of those things right. to carry you in. Yeah, it's like I know where I want to take you. How do I keep you interested enough to take you to that one place? Well, you're Very definitely doing it in Strange so New Worlds very well. Oh, yes, well, definitely. All. So I have um, to ask a very go ahead, self, Chris. Please, I have to ask a very selfish question because I'm going through film school right now, and so I'm just curious for myself and anyone who's listening who's also maybe aspiring to direct or write. What advice would you have for someone who's not in the industry but would like to get into the industry? Um, do it. Just don't wait for just, someone to mm. tell you to do it. Um, go and get if you could only if you could. Afford a cheap camera, get a cheap camera used, get an old, uh, and and just shoot stuff that you don't plan to show anybody. You know, mm. shoot, shoot, and, and and I say this because it's the process I've done. It's the process that I've seen very many successful people have done. Um, and um, you know, I took college courses at a junior college because if you took the film co classes, you got access to their mini DV cams. And so I got access to the mini DV cams and I did the course, but I also made another short with their cameras, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I um, learned so much doing that. And you can only learn by doing it. And no one's mm -hmm. ever going to tell you or give you permission and say, oh, you're ready now. Or, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. now's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I wish I had kind of known that sooner. I kind of felt it and I was doing it intuitively like I was uh taking my parents camcorders and using my gi joes 
to tell little cinematic stop action short films just because I wanted to to do that. And I was um, doing that just for fun. And then as an adult, like I was a struggling actor. And the thing about being a struggling actor is you need people to hire you, right? Same with the director. You need someone Hmm. to maybe give you money to make your Mm -hmm. short. Um, As a writer, you just need time and and motivation. And then I kind of realized as a director, I, I don't need money. I could make low budget just for me, just to put a camera in my hand, just to know that if I look this way and and then I try to edit it, I I crossed the line and I did a mistake, but that mistake cost me what, like $8 of a VHS tape, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I I practice, it's like practicing. Like if you want to, you you can't be a painter and not paint on canvas. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to get an expensive oil and go and get this, big it, it just no but you're going to get a sketchbook and you're going to practice and you're going to practice so if you want to be a filmmaker and you want to do a cinematic story you got to practice putting stories on screen you know mm-hmm. and and, mm. and and as hard as that might be to share with people or as hard as they might be to watch because you're like fuck i suck <laughs> <laughs> they're not for right. they're you know those first pieces aren't meant to be shared mm-hmm. you know they're just like you know if you have an idea for a scene and you want to see what it looks like on screen. And, mm. and the, here's the here's the other great part, right? Actors want to act. And there's acting schools out there of all of these people who want experience. And so if you find a group of people, that's the other piece of advice. Find yourself a group of people that, that are want to have learning experiences and want to have fun doing this with you. Mm-hmm. And that you're all kind of at the same level. If, mm-hmm. if someone's above you or someone's below you, it's going to be a little difficult. But if everyone is kind of at your same level ground of trying to break in, about to break in, and just like, hey, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I want to do a, a short on Saturday. Uh, it's going to be like four hours of work. I'll buy a pizza. We'll, we'll, we'll do a scene from your class or a scene that I wrote. And you'll get to practice being on camera. I'll get to be practicing where I put mm. the camera. I'll get to see how bad I am with the lights I rented or the lights I own, whatever. Mm-hmm. And and then shoot it and then wa- and try to edit it and then go, God, there's a lot I need to learn. But I learned something the last time. I want to try the next one to be a little better. You know what I mean? Mm. That's fantastic okay. yeah, advice. That's, cool. that's good advice. No, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I mean, we could go on for another couple hours. I know. Because uh, you've, been, you've been so wonderful, <laughs> I have Davey, with us. One, but go ahead, Chris. One last question if we have time. I feel sure, like I have of course. To, I have to talk about this and ask this. is On behalf of every Canadian listening to this, <laughs> the, tomorrow yes. and tomorrow, what went into the process of deciding that it's going to be in Toronto? Because to me, like nothing's ever, everything that's filmed in Toronto is either New York or it's a Canadian show. Right. So to have an American show like Star Trek it, it, be filmed in Toronto and have it be Toronto was like a huge moment. It's I'm glad. And I'm glad. And it's funny because it was, and this is maybe telling a little bit of the, um, where the bodies are buried. It was in its inception also a good movie. Um, <laughs> Very good. Going to be in New York. And we were like, hey, we could shoot Toronto as New York. And maybe the Brooklyn Bridge is uh, blown up. Or, you know, what are the things that are very New York? And then we were like, we are going in circles to try and cheat a city that's actually an iconic city with its space needle mm-hmm. and its own elements. And why don't we just embrace the torontoness of it and that was kind of a fun moment of like oh yeah like there are no rules we're in a city we're in a city Mm -hmm. and not only it's like it's it's you know earth in an alternative future and you know not everything it has to be so uh americana centric it's Mm -hmm. Star, star trek we are in Toronto. It's easy for production. It's kind of fun for the story. Now, what is it about this that is going to kind of inform the script now? And we just leaned into it. And it it, it really kind of actually, it was that moment of like, aha, this is going to bring certain things to life uh, mm-hmm. for that particular episode. Mm. And it was refreshing, too, to see not New York being used. Right. You know, My I mean, it was has really gotten nice. Beat up quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was right. quite ready for us to get yeah. destroyed, at least by one alien <laughs> yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. You know? But again, it's <laughs> like you've seen that. I mean, 
You've LA, seen that, right? LA got blown up in War of the Worlds and Independence right. Day. It's time for somebody others. Let's go I, I, wreck, like, wreck another yeah. city. LA, finally. Chicago, Boston, you know. <laughs> yeah. I still want the Independence yeah. Day of what was happening in Toronto in Toronto uh story. But I have to say though, like watching <laughs> that first the 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 season two trailer and be like, oh my gosh, is that the root store? Is that a Toronto Maple Leaf <laughs> yeah, jersey yeah, 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 in yeah, Star yeah. Trek? I'm like, that's incredible. Yeah, and I love so the fact fun. that Kirk goes out to lunch and he goes, gravy on French fries? I yeah, mean, this yeah, is yeah, crazy. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. It's like, <laughs> that is from so Toronto? Canadian. It's wonderful. Yeah, from Toronto. Which I, mean, I guess is something we should be proud of. But <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that was a really, really nice treat. Oh, well, thank you. One of my my old boss, she originally was from Canada, and when she went to a restaurant here in L.A. and they put gravy on French fries, she was she almost broke into tears. She was like, "Oh my God, this is just like home," you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Before I sign off, I just want to say thank you for having me. I love being here, and hopefully, you'll have me back sometime. Thank you for oh, your yeah. time. And just say the word. Just let us know when. We'll After season three has been aired, we would <laughs> love to have you wanted to chat about that when it's legal. I'd love to be back. There you have it, folks. A little insight into the workings of the writing, a writer for Strange New Worlds. We, the Big Sci-Fi Podcast team, are so appreciative of had on our show someone of the caliber of Davey. It allows us to get to know how a TV show like Strange New Worlds is produced. As I've stated before, without a script writers, there wouldn't be any characters, any story, nothing. It all begins with the written word. And we are so happy that the writers and actor strike ended and that we can look forward to season three of Strange New Worlds. Yes, folks, when it's legal, we'll chat about it then. If you have any comments on this episode or any other episodes, please share them on at Facebook or Instagram pages or send us an email to the big side by podcast at gmail.com. Your positive comments help to support us and move us up the pecking order of podcasts, both nationally and internationally. I'm talking about you, Norway. You hear me? <laughs> Thanks again to Trek Geeks for supporting us. And, and, and we look forward to meeting you at Trek Long Island on May 31st through June the 2nd. Get those entry tickets, airline tickets, room accommodation, so we can meet you there, as well as the folks of, as well as other folks, and our fellow podcasters from Trek Geeks. We plan to have fun and games at the event, but above all, to meet new or old friends, like I did on September the eighth when I met our interviewee, Davy Perez. As they sang on The Simpsons, a stranger is a friend you haven't met. As always, let me close by saying, keep watching the skies, live long and prosper.